Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm John Saul, and one of the ideas at the heart of all of this was that, you know, we noticed at the Institute of Canadian Citizenship that over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a rise of return of racism, everything that goes, racism sort of came last, I mean, populism before that, ugly forms of nationalism as opposed to interesting forms of nationalism, uh, and things have been getting out of control. There's, there's a kind of anger out there. Um, people in Europe survive elections. They're happy that only a third of the population voted fascist, right? <laughs> voted racist. Uh, mainstream parties are changing their positions so that they can pick off some of the votes that might go to the, the fascists or the racists or the neo-fascists or whatever you want to call them. So we thought, let's put this six degrees together. We have to be able to have comfortable, uncomfortable conversations in order to come up with a discourse which can dominate the public place. Because at this point, the public place is being dominated by the discourse of fear and the discourse of anger and the discourse of inclusion. And to some extent, Canada is holding out. We're sort of lucky that we had our ugly phase before the other people had their ugly phase. And so we're actually in a better position just by pure accident, not because we're better. Um, and, and so uh, that, one of the purposes of this whole thing is to produce discourse, language, ways, ideas, practical things to do, but ways of talking. Because it's, you know, it is this discourse which is making people feel they can be rude, they can be racist, they can be angry racist, and it's justified because they're angry, right? That somehow they've been hard done by. So, uh, we, we had a, a, about 45 minute chat before we came in here and, and I don't know if people kind of will agree but in a way uh, it was fascinating this morning and I think it was really, I think we all feel it was very valuable. There were the beginnings of people saying it ain't so pretty here. You know, here's some examples of real racism and real exclusion. There was a really great beginning of a conversation which is a gigantic conversation about indigenous rights and indigenous people and the role that they should and can play. Um, but there was also and I think you're, the comfort, discomfort, there was also, in my mind at least, a, a certain confusion, not, not in our brains, but in the way we talk about it, which is that, you know, the, 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 the European, Westphalian, monolithic, US model of the nation state is, hey, we all agree, we're all the same, there's nothing to be explained, I'm French, I'm English, there's nothing to be said, let's just get on with it. But that's built on 500 years of destroying and excluding people. You know, as was said, it's, it's built on 100 million people being murdered between 1914 and 1946. A massive civil war about excluding minorities and different opinions. So, so there is this really strange thing that here we are in this country, which we all we call, say in very different ways, but is essentially a very confusing place. On purpose. At best. At best. And, and that, 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 that diversity, that confusion, that uncertainty uh, is central to our ability to live with each other. The admission that there are enormous differences but that we can live together. There are some models maybe coming out of indigenous peoples, the return of the voice of the indigenous people to, uh, when I say the return of the voice, the return of the voice in a way that we can hear it because we didn't want to hear it. Um, and, and what we have to be probably very careful about is that of course we have the racism that exists in all those other countries and the exclusion, but are we actually coming at it in a way which is, resembles the way the Europeans and the Americans have come at it, or are we going to reinvent another discourse, another way of living together, and just say, we're not better, we're not smarter, we just have to do it differently in order to survive here. And, and what is that gonna sound like? And it is indeed complexity, and it is, it is comfort with discomfort. And in fact, you could say that places like most European countries are comfortable because they've excluded discomfort. And so we have to figure out a way to be happy with discomfort. And, and I think so. I think what, what we, we'd like to do is just sort of start off where we left off this morning. And um, maybe, maybe Rima would start us off with just, well, let me, let me just read a quote, which, which I think is a wonderful quote. Um, uh, from uh, a Sufi, Persian Sufi philosopher in about 900 AD, Mansur al-Halaj, um, you know, from that 
religion which apparently is incapable of civilization according to <laughs> you know the angry people out there uh, and he said hell is not the place where we suffer it's the place where no one hears us suffering you know and so that's part of this living with discomfort that we have to hear about the suffering and we have to hear about the differences and we have and and last comment and then I'll pass it to you I think is is uh, it's a very interesting fact that indigenous people in Canada almost in always begin their interventions by saying who they are and where they're from and describing their families so that the racism we all know that's unacceptable but the idea of, the, of explaining ourselves which is f incredibly exhausting even when it's got nothing to do with racism is kind of interesting and that is the indigenous model actually not justified if a policeman pulls you over and says explain yourself who are you that's a completely different thing that's that's racism but um so i just i don't know Remo, what, how would you start it? So thank, let's thank just go right into the kind of racism thing okay. right away <laughs> no i mean is that a good place to start let's do it i want to pick up from where uh june francis left off this yeah. morning i think that is is about power and it is a question of being at home, if we're really going to be at home, and all of us are really going to be able to be at home equitably, then we all have to be able to know that we can share power equitably. And the problem of being asked, who are you, or what are you, which is a thing that many of us get, not just where are you from, but what are you, mm. uh, is that it comes with a power. It comes with the sense of, you're not really Canadian, you're not really one of, i.e. you're not white, so what are you, where do you fit in my classification box so that I can degrade you, dehumanize you? And I think that if we are going to change this so that it really works, we have to, we have to throw up in the air and throw out the idea that there is anything normal about whiteness. It's a really difficult topic for people to talk about. It makes a lot of people very uncomfortable, but we need to go there. Whiteness is not the norm, and the idea that most white folks have, that they still control things and are the folks who have the voices with the power, that has to go. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. I don't know, Max. Yeah, I think, uh, so I have to explain myself and, and introduce myself and say, Naskuman, Naskuman Kakyo, Nasiga Sunkis Gaupi Simwasis, Egua, Wikasko Tsinia. I just told you that I'm a little nervous that these chairs are see through. I'm worried people can see my underwear. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Good for back here, Max. Yeah, all right. That's good. I said, My name is Max Finder. I come from the Sweetgrass First Nation. I thank you all for being here. I thank our kind and loving creator for, for giving us a, a date to be here and talk about these hard things. Rima's like my auntie. Uh, she's uh, been very involved with my family, so I can't disagree with anything that she says ever. And it's lucky that she has such good politics and is so wise so that I don't have to. <laughs> We're at this moment in time where um, uh, there's a shift. There's a shift in Canada. You see it in the news. Uh, you hear it in the way people talk. But you also, you see young people uh, who are so excited about what's happening in terms of reconciliation, in terms of act activism. Uh, you know, I'm up here to say um, I'm idle no more, uh, black lives matter, and there will be no Muslim ban on stolen land. Um, that's what you see, that's what you hear in the streets. We also have um, our parents' generation, uh, our moms and dads who we love, uh, but who don't know these things. For these things, it wasn't normal to them. Uh, I'm a very proud half Norwegian, um, it's where I get my strong facial hair genes from, as you can see. Um, when my mom was going to school, she said, um, they didn't tell us anything about Nehawak, about your nation, about your people. They didn't tell us about First Nations. They had told us that we got to live here um, because they were all dead, that all the Indians were gone, and that this was our, this was our inheritance, this, this beautiful, pristine prairie. Uh, what we see in this, in this generation of our moms and dads is, is uh, a holding on uh, to old systems, old ways of thinking. They, they, they are reluctant, as I think anyone would be, to give up the power, to give up the privilege, to give up the elected positions or, 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 or being the CEO, all this sort of stuff. When we're talking about 
diversity, when we're talking about inclusion, uh, that's where we have to start. And I encourage you know, the mums and dads, the aunties and uncles in the room uh, to think about how they're making space for that next generation of folks to come and, uh, and take on that work for them and, and change it and be accepting of that. Well, I think there's two ways to, sorry. <laughs> to go to the other white guy up here and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and this is my favorite white guy. Yeah, this is my yeah, favorite yeah, white guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. From Saskatchewan. I'm from Saskatchewan. You know? And who, you know, has, uh, has done a lot in the educational field, I think, mm -hmm. in that rethinking of where we go next. I mean, how, let's just, the idea, by the way, is we, we, we sort of decided what we thought we'd try and do was like 45 minutes of trying to put everything out there we can put out there, and then 45 minutes more or less of, so what are we going to do about this? What are we going to try? What are the suggestions? And you can be part of both of those. But what we don't want to have you do is in the second 45 minutes be telling us about everything that's wrong. You've got to get that into the first 45 minutes mm -hmm. so that we can actually, in the second part, be hearing some suggestions, some ideas, not, not whatever, attitudes. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm going to follow Max's uh, story, and I'll start with my own story. Because many people ask me why I was involved in this. How did I get involved in these issues? <clears throat> and the story is this. I was a Crown Prosecutor, senior Crown Prosecutor, then a judge in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, which is surrounded by 10 First Nations within a 50-kilometer radius. And the doors of the courtroom would open every day, and a sea of Indigenous people would come in. And at some point, you know, I guess you don't have to be a rocket scientist, but at some point I said, something's very fundamentally wrong here. And how do we change that? because the justice system is supposed to be just and fair, and I could see that it wasn't, and I was part of it. So <clears throat> I needed to make an outreach to the First Nations community. Now, I was challenged by a judge in BC to do that, but there was a problem. I didn't know any First Nations people. I'd never had a First Nations person into my house to, for a supper or anything. So a judge took me to Hobima, Alberta, and I went into a sweat lodge ceremony, first time I'd ever been in it. And I said to the uh, lodge keeper, I really want to make an outreach to the First Nations people in my community. How do I do it? Can you help me? And he said, when you go back to North Battleford, here's a name, here's a phone number, phone this person. And I went back to North Battleford and quite frankly, it took a little bit of guts to actually make the call. It took me about a week to get the courage up. And I made the call out to Palmmaker First Nation, the next door to Sweetgrass. And the <clears throat> person at the other end answered the phone. I said, hi, I'm the local judge. He said, yeah, I know. We've been waiting for your call. <laughs> for over a hundred years. <laughs> and he meant it. So that, was, that began uh, the Tatusis family in the uh, next door nation, the Cree nation in Saskatchewan, to give me the full immersion program about Cree language, Cree uh, spirituality, Cree worldview. And there's one thing that I've learned very clearly. First Nations people look at the world in a much different way than non-Aboriginal people do. And the non-Aboriginal people in Canada have a lot to learn from the way the First Nations people look at the world. And that's a sad thing. On the other hand, the First Nations people are quite willing to share that. Very patient in doing so, quite willing to share it. I think in Canada we have this model of equality. That's our goal. That's the theory. But that's, we're not hitting that theory very well. So as a practical solution, I say that we need to focus on educating Canadians, certainly in the grades K to 12, but all Canadians on the concept of equity or fairness, because we'll never get to a true equality unless we really understand equity, and we're not there yet. So that's the way I would deal with these, th that issue. That's a first investment. And there's... No, remember, we're going to do the, yeah. the solutions Edu in the second half. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Education is the engine of democracy. So what are you going to feed that engine with? What's the fuel? And I'll be quiet now. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I think I just want to tease out, you know, where, where we think we are in terms of what's working and uh, what's not working and how far we are along in the first half and then move, you know. And so... Um, what do you, what do you, what, how would you fit into this? What's not working? It's yeah, I mean, how far along are we <laughs> in terms of the, the profound things that are not working on the Indigenous front? I mean, where, where, where are the motors of, of blockage? Right, right. I mean, you're, you're sitting up in, in the near north. Yeah. <laughs> we had this funny <laughs> the conversation. Of the north. The beginning, <laughs> the beginning of the north. Of the north. 
Yeah. And, and, and here we are in the deep south, the deepest south in Canada, apart from perhaps Victoria, where everybody's convinced that they're speaking for the country, <laughs> which they have not visited and do not know, and where they're structured. Toronto's worse. <laughs> yeah. uh, but Vancouver is not much better, uh, you know, and they're convinced that, you know, that the solutions are here um, and they really just don't know how it functions in three quarters of the country. Right, right. Well, you know, again, so going back to, we do actually, as a First Nations person and as uh, Indigenous people, uh, to understand where I'm coming from and what I say, you have to know where I'm from. And, uh, and that is a classic thing, so what do I call home? Um, so I'm Anishinaabe from the Sagamok First Nation, but my dad is an immigrant from Italy, so I've been on both sides, I'm on both sides of the fence. Um, I say the best birthday present I ever got was the ability to tan. And that was really good, that was huge for me when I was a teenager. Um, but you know, I ultimately chose the path of healthcare, so uh, I'm a physician. And um, I think fundamentally, I think it was all starting to open to me when I realized that uh, everyone made a big deal when you were a first. Uh, you were the first female uh, graduate from UBC Faculty of Medicine, which meant when I went into medical school at UBC, there wasn't a single indigenous physician in the province of British Columbia. And I like to think I'm young. I'm not like, I'm not talking about 80 years ago. Um, and uh, then the first female uh, general surgeon in Canada. And the, the bizarre thing is that when I say that, if I said it to Max, he would be like, whoa. But when I say that, or it comes up, uh, in other audiences, in the general Canadian public, in society, they're like, whoa. <laughs> and then you, you have to sort of reel them in and you have to say, you know, hold on a second. Um, there was absolutely nothing special about me when I went to medical school. There, I was in with everyone else. I had great friends, I had great colleagues, and uh, everyone was the same, and we all went through medical school. We survived and we got MD. Then I went into surgery, and uh, it was you know, an interesting uh, six years of surgical residency, but everyone was the same. Like We had to learn the same stuff and do the same stuff. Uh, so what's different about that is that uh, if I'm the first, it means that what is happening to our education system that when you go through, it's this filter. And it's not a filter where you can make a cup of coffee like out of, you know, where there's lots of water flowing down and it tastes good at the end and you can, it is like, it stops. It's like the cup of coffee where, you know, when you use the grinds too much, when you're on a tight budget and the water goes in and doesn't move, there's, there's these bottlenecks way upstream. And, uh, and so when I started working, law was way ahead of its time uh, in terms of how do you build that power how do you get the indigenous voice to the table? Well, you, you know, how do you make it there? Well, you create choice, and you create choice for our youth and for our Canadian citizens. And how do you do that? Well, you, you, you create those opportunities. Law did it way before medicine, but all of a sudden we are creating admission programs across the country in medical schools, uh, and no one was applying. Does it sound familiar? Because we talked about it as a big problem to SFU and President Petter got put on the, on the spot, and that's why I came forward and I said, you know what? UBC had this admissions program and no one was applying mm -hmm. because you need to graduate from high school mm -hmm. to actually apply to medical school. You, you, need to, you, know, you need to finish grade 10 to have a chance to get a Dogwood degree in, in British Columbia. And so there's all these sort of barriers. And so there's lots of problems, lots and lots of problems. But the unfortunate thing, I think the biggest problem is by the time you are out there as a, as a Canadian citizen in society and finding your path and deciding what you want to do, there's so many doors that are close to you as an Indigenous person that you spend the rest of your adult life with some people trying to open them up and, and figuring out how are they going to overcome barriers that are just unjust, unfair, and un so like do egregious. You, do you think those are just straight old-fashioned racism? I think a lot of it comes from that. Um, I think a lot of it comes from the relocation. I think a lot of it comes from, um, if you look at healthcare, it's really hard to get um, uh, specialists up in small rural communities if it comes to education. Uh, you know, getting enough teachers to go to these small communities to teach. If it comes to, uh, you know, a anything, you could pick just about anything. If it comes to wanting to buy a piece of fruit on a reserve, it means you have to have some organize some business that's willing to bring in bananas instead of 
of chips, chips. because uh. chips last forever. They have an expiry date, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> But they last forever, and that, but the bananas are just too expensive. And so you can say that they're brilliant businessmen and they're brilliant corporations, but uh, if you just, just spend a day on an average reserve in Canada, and uh, you are surrounded by barriers that you need a very, very good piece of optimistic pair of glasses. And, uh, and I think the, the thing is, is that I think, Max, I, I agree with you. I think we're on the stage where um, the youth are expecting something different. I think, I think Canada's on the verge of expecting something different. And I think that our, our values, and I think we're a nation that um, things are becoming non-negotiable. And they still exist, but the good thing about it is when it happens and when I see it, and if I point it out, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of people behind me saying, yeah, you were right, Nadine. Like, that was, that was wrong. Whether it's racism in the hallways of a hospital or whether it's walking in, into, into a community and wondering, you know, why the heck is this not here? Um, I think we're at a point, and it, but it, I, my one concern is that it, we're at a point as a country, especially with the TRC, that we need to grab it or we are going to be forever wondering why didn't we just grab it when we had the, the government in place, the, the social justice in place, the document just there waiting to be harnessed. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask you a technical question. About how many Indigenous doctors are there in the country now? Would you, you know, guess? Yeah, you know what? It would be within the. It would be listed in the hundreds in terms of graduates. So, for example, UBC just celebrated. Two years ago, we celebrated that we had 50 graduates in total over the history of the University of British mm -hmm. Columbia. That was huge, but you have to remember that after you graduate from medical school, like it took me another seven years of education to be able to practice. Sure. So there's a lot of people in the pipelines. But the thing is, we're in the pipelines. So that pipeline is getting pretty thick. You know, we're, we're getting pretty thick, and, and soon there's going to be uh, people, I think Indigenous people are going to be able to look and, and they're like, they want a First Nations doctor. You know, it'll, I think the time will pass eventually where I have patients that come into my office that when they realize I'm First Nations break into tears and said, I cannot believe, I never thought in my lifetime that I would have an Indigenous doctor. And, yeah. and so I think we're, we're, there, there's a pipeline and there's changes and it's improving. Um, but we're at the point where if you name an Indigenous doctor in Canada, I'm willing to bet that I've heard of them. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, the, the reason there are a couple of hundred yeah, well, yeah, probably more than that now across the whole entire country. And whereas there are 2,500 lawyers, yeah. is because the federal government and the provincial governments and the corporations said, you can have whatever you want, but you're going to have to win it in the courts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's really what happened was that the federal government forced Indigenous people to go through the law. And mm -hmm. we're yeah. still, as you know, the federal government is spending $125 million a year on lawyers fighting justice, fighting yeah. against justice for Indigenous people. Whereas we could have had 2,500 <laughs> doctors and 300 lawyers, which yeah. probably would have been enough. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 I don't know. Well, 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 we never have enough lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bobby, you, you've been here, what, two years now? Two years. Yeah, so you listened to all of this. You've seen a lot of this. I mean, what's, what's your impression? I mean, do you, uh, what's your experience? What's your impression? Well, um, I decided to host a, an open exchange, a conversation about racism uh, during um, the last session. And I, I did uh, do that because I wanted to, to see or to get a closer look into people's experiences. What I did start my session with uh, was asking everybody, did you experience uh, racism yourself? Raise your hand if you do. And I'm going to ask this question now. Raise your hand if you ever faced it here in Canada. And that was similar to what I found during my open exchange. About 40% of people say that they did experience Canada. I do have personal experience with it, whereas when I first came here, um, I did come here uh, two years ago as a refugee from Syria, um, and I was faced with many challenges at the same time. And I was trying very hard to cope with them. Um, so I, I still remember my first uh, landlord or landlady in Canada and how when I had to move in, um, she uh, kept the, um, the deposit, the security deposit, because the Canadian government gave, gave it to me without realizing that actually refugees take loans to cover their, their security deposit, their travel expenses, their medical checks, their 
there is some missing information that leads to a lot of prejudice. Uh, prejudice. And I did find out uh, from my experience and from listening to other people's experiences that racism is only what, what surfaces. You, uh, this, it's only the, that um, uh, what we see from a whole spectrum of hatred a spectrum of prejudice toward the other. And I think what we're trying to talk about here is um, why do we assume sometimes that there are some people from a specific or particular uh, ethnic background or religious background or, or, or are incompatible with our society? Why do we have a problem with accepting the other just because they are different? I try my best to track the whole conversation back to its uh, origins. And I, I really think that we are dealing with a colonial history, both here in Canada and outside of the country. Um, I mean, let me just share with you uh, my own homeland, Syria. Uh, right after the, uh, the war um, between the Allies and the Ottoman Empire, Mr. George uh, Sykes, the English, and Mr. Vico, the French, sat down and had coffee or tea, I don't know, but <laughs> they decided that they are gonna break down the area and draw imaginary lines, and they told us, this is your nation, this is your home. Are you home? <laughs> I don't know, but you know, it's been, after a few decades, the nations that they decide, designed for us collapsed. They couldn't, we couldn't really, uh, sustain it because it was based on on a lot of wrong ideas. ideas and it's also here uh, we have a very complicated history that has a, a big colonial background to it and now we're told that this is your country and you have to answer the question of are you home but you can really track down some patterns that had to do with the concept of people assuming that they are giving you what they think that you need without actually consulting you and asking you what do you think. Right. Yeah. Well, let's, I mean, yes, sorry. Any more? I, I would love to, if it's okay, to add on to what you were saying, because I think it's really important that we actually name Islamophobia as an issue that is growing in this country right now. And a little while ago, Angus Reid did a poll that found that only 42% of Canadians would have supported MP Ikra Khalid's uh, motion. That means that 58% of Canadians, some of you are probably in this room, would not have supported it. 29% would have voted outright against it and 29% wasn't sure. You should be ashamed of yourselves. I'm sorry, but you should be. And this is because some mainstream politicians and mainstream organizations have decided that there's really something hmm, about Muslims and that maybe they're not actually, you know, one of us. So, let's... Um, you, you've I've got, got a, a few questions over here, but uh, it would be good to stay, uh, maybe stay on Islamophobia for a moment. I think just to, rather than jumping all over the place, then we can come back if you have a question on other things. Homa has a, a comment that good. is staying along lines. Okay. Sorry, just adding to Muhammad's points. A little Thank closer. Uh, adding to Muhammad's points, just I, what I see based on my personal experience and my parents everywhere, everyone in my family, my friends, just so I can say what we see in Canada is, I don't think I call polite racism. Mm. Just saying sorry, but adding to that racism. Uh, I think based on what you said just now, uh, trust and feeling secure, regardless of your religion, regardless of your name, regardless of your last name, whether being Muhammad, whether being something that reminds anybody that he or she is Muslim or any kind of ethnicity. It's something that we don't see in Canada. And, but as far as we don't, I mean, Canadian or I say politician don't want to look at this carefully or they hide it behind the terms like multiculturalism, diversity. And 
just don't want to measure that how they have contributed to this. Not just uh, saying we have a decent immigration system, we have a good multicultural and we have a successful immigration system. These are not things that are not, these are not measured, but year and year we see that more racism behind terms that are accepted and fed into society. Just I want to add this to your points, thanks. So, I mean, it would be interesting just to, the, on the one hand, there's Islamophobia, which is, as we know, has a, I mean, there's a long history, but there's also the short history, which is the last, what, 20 years, with some real bumps, like the Twin Towers, uh, being an excuse for people to say all sorts of things. Um, and, and then there are, you know, there, there are the longer established racisms. But, but is there any other comments on, on Islamophobia at the moment? We've got a couple here, Darcy. Hi, my name is Darcy. I think, um, I think the big problem is, and it's what our society has the hardest time admitting to ourselves, and it's the first step in unpacking, is that I think everybody is inherently racist. And they don't want to believe that, and they don't want to look inwards and grapple with the realities and the views that have been constructed by our society that they hold internally, whether consciously or not. Um, and I think the first step is admitting to yourself that you, you hold prejudices, you hold, you hold these, these, these views that you maybe don't believe in or you don't want to believe in, but they, they sit there. And I think what's happened is, in light of growing inequality, that the political systems, to go back to this little broader, have failed us, both the left and the right, we're turning on each other, and people are exploiting these internal biases and making it ugly. And I think it, I think it, roops, it lopes back to inequality, um, and, it, and it goes back to that deep soul searching that people need to look in at how they feel, whether they want to or not, and unpack that. Is there anybody else on his mind? One, one more, and then we. Oh, here, here. Let, we're going to go back to Okay. One more perfect. Yeah, let Mohammed throw, throw in Great. something here. And and we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, you know, just talking about Islamophobia, um, I want to highlight another layer of, of uh, the misconceptions about it. And um, it's, it's not an, a new discussion to have, but it's, it's surfacing because of the political atmosphere that is um, happening around us. Um, and I, I really want to you know, expose the fact that many people would have agree assumptions uh, would, you know, I still get it like whenever we want to go out and have fun, um, I get the question like, do you drink? I mean, you're a Muhammad, so, you know, people would assume that you don't drink. They don't let you express yourself and order a drink or not. Um, uh, also, um, the, uh, I, uh, Islam, just like any other ideology, is, is a, a very complex with many layers of, a spectrum of uh, 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 interpretations, and to assume that all Muslims are following just what, I don't know, 0 0.05 yeah. percentage of the population is, is totally um, nonsense. Um, uh, finally, uh, you know, whether of, of uh, if we are, are Muslim, I, I think we are, as Muslims in um, North American communities, have to engage in conversations just like this to work on how do we engage ourselves into our um, host communities, to how to waive these pre assumptions, how to build uh, f bridges of friendship with our neighbors all the time. And, you know, I'm not the best Muslim. I, I don't pray five times a day or, 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 or you know, follow the, 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 the whole list. But, you know, at the end of the day, my name is Mohammed. I come from Syria, I am a Muslim whether if I like it or not, and I stand for, I don't know, the, la the latest um, uh, number, so, uh, that uh, the, the numbers surpassed um, a billion and a half or two, so, I mean, uh, there is a lot of, I would close on one note that there is a lot of unlearning that has to be done. We have to unlearn some things in order to move forward. Who has to, sorry, uh, who has to unlearn? Everybody. Everybody in, you know, on the note of having diverse communities, having multiculturalism, mm. 
it's a, it's a reality. You can't really run from multiculturalism or diversity. It's, uh, it's, it's up to you how to cope with it, how to deal with it. And there you can make choices. There you can take approaches. So even though diversity is a reality, inclusion is a choice that communities can make. If, if I'm allowed to make one little comment on Islamophobia, which is, uh, I, I don't think you can make it actually, I can make it, because I come from a, a Northern Irish background. Uh, in the history of immigration to Canada, there's only one group which was a serious threat to uh, order and peace, and that was my people. Uh, the single most violent group of immigrants over an extended period of time were the Northern Irish. Uh, the Orange Order was a secret society which was used by the Family Compact and the Shadow Clique in order to delay and defeat democracy for a long period of time and people died in elections on a regular basis. The Orange Order chased Robert Baldwin, the great hero of democracy, across a farmer's field trying to kill him in the 1840s. I mean, so, I mean, it's always quite interesting when I'm listening to things about uh, Islamic violence, say, you got nothing on the Orange Order. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke, but I mean, it's uh, not a bad joke. John, uh, I have one, John, one more Adrian intervention wants behind to, you. Adrian yep. actually wants to just uh, take okay. up a comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Active listening, Adrian Clarkson, everyone. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt him. And um, I wanted to pick up on what you said over here about people being racist inside. And there's no question that in the heart of human beings, there is darkness. All re religions recognize this. They're based on the fact that human beings are not good inside. Otherwise, what would religions have to do? <laughs> so that is not our problem. We are not going to change people inside. But one of my favorite authors, Hemingway, who was certifiably a literary a prodigy and genius because he wrote one of the greatest novels in the English language when he was 23 and it was published when he was 25. The Sun Also Rises. I reread it every year. I love it. And in it, somebody behaves, ex you know, is, punches somebody else out. He's the boyfriend of Brett, and Brett says to Jake, her other boyfriend, I couldn't believe that Robert behaved so badly, and because he went to Harvard and he was a nice guy, etc. And Jake says to Brett, everybody behaves badly if you give them the chance. So our institutions, our democratic structures, are set up so that people will not be given the chance to behave badly. And it is our business as citizens and as people to elect people who will not allow us to behave badly. What you want to believe by yourself and maybe with a little coterie of friends in your own house under your influence, that's your business. But once you are dealing in the public sphere as a citizen, you have to behave well if the structures are right and we have voted for them. Thank you, Adrian. And John, in fact, we have another intervener who would like to speak about yep. institutionalism as well, so I feel like maybe this is a good time, Melody. Yeah. Um, so I'm Melody Ma. I am an activist for Chinatown in Vancouver to protect it from cultural erasure. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit about institutional racism because it is still alive and well. Um, and I want to talk about a personal story that I went through, going through Chinatown, where I experienced that. Uh, so as you know, in Chinatown, there's a high population of English as second language citizens and a high population of senior citizens that are Chinese. Um, and the city of Vancouver has opened houses for new developments that affect these seniors, that affect citizens who live in this community. Um, however, the city of Vancouver doesn't often offer translation of their English open house notices to Chinese. And in fact, I have to protest on Twitter in order to get notice that these notices weren't being translated. And at one point, I actually had a city employee, a planner, who tweeted back at me saying, bilingualism is hard. And the surprising thing about this was that this person wasn't white. He didn't come from a Euro background. He looked exactly like me. He was Chinese. 
right? So it's not about your skin color anymore, but rather institutional racism, this, and it's not intentional either, but these systems that we have set up that are Eurocentric, that has forced us to think about you know, systems and processes in a certain way and to move forward, we have to go beyond that. So, I mean, Charlie, I think you've got somebody. I have three or four over here, John, but did you want to pick any of that up before we move? No, no I mean, unless somebody okay. here would like to pick some Maybe of Maybe you up. want to pick up on that on stage? I mean, I think it's, it speaks for itself. Yes, it does. You know, it only should. needs to be. All right, this uh, but then I think first. soon we're going to move to just trying to right. weave together ways of, of, of dealing with it. Right. I mean, yes. If I could, then I'll do three quick ones over here because we've had some people been waiting a long time, and then we'll Go. make the turn in the conversation. Uh, so this is something like uh, part of what I've suffered and dealing with it also. Uh, I'm from Bombay. I came here four and a half years ago. Uh, I was uh, discriminated against. Uh, I was feeling a bit lost. I got a job at Van City. Now that whole thing is set, this is uh, what I call ho my home. And because of Van City, I've been working, uh, doing a lot of uh, work with the homeless. Uh, in fact, I would like to say that, Mohammed, yesterday I was, my Chinese friend invited me to a Muslim mosque in Delta on the day of Prophet Muhammad's accession. Yesterday was Meiraj. Yes. They were discussing the life of Jesus Christ in a Muslim mosque. <laughs> Three different church leaders were there, plus two Muslim uh, mosque leaders were there. I had my seven-year-old with me, and he asked me that, Dad, this is a mosque, and they're talking about Jesus. I said, yes. And the best thing was that they had different views, but they were finding out the similarities. So what we have to do is that find out the similarities. And that's what I think. This is my house now, and I would like to do that. And that's what we can do is teach our children. Start with that. That's what I say, half an hour. I sit with my 16 and seven-year-old, sit with them, take them out in the community, Teach them about the indigenous people. And you know one more thing? There's so much similarities between the First Nations and uh, Sufi saints. I, uh, with Van City, I had the honor of, you know, uh, volunteering at one of the functions. The blessing ceremony in a Sufi saint is very, is similar to the blessing ceremony of the First Nations. They have that peacock feather and that mm -hmm. the smoke thing. Same. So we have to look at similarities. Education. Education. Educate our, our, our kids. And Thank then you. We'll all be together. Right? Great. Thank you so much. Back here, and then I'll come over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I am from Somalia, so I am a Muslim, but it's not like I don't have any sign that is recognizable that I'm a Muslim. So when it, when we talk about Islamophobia, I really sympathize with Muslim women because they are the ones who the bullies usually target, and they are the ones who have a visible sign with the, with the hijab they have in their head that people usually attack. Personally, it might be, I might not get an interview because of my name, who cares, that's fine, I will get another one. But the real problem when we talk about Islamophobia is the sisters, we call them sisters, yeah, basically the women. Uh, so those are the people that we, we really need to talk about and how we can protect them because they have a sign that shows that they are actually Muslims and those are the ones that people usually take it. Uh, another point is uh, how people really don't understand what they are talking about, because for me, I was born Muslim, but when I came here, I questioned it, and I learned about it, and I found that it's the right thing to be. I will give you a good example. A lot of people talk about FGM, the female genital mutilation, and how it's related to Islam. It has nothing to do with Muslims. Somalis do it, it's something wrong. I always talk about it. Ethiopia is a Christian country, and it has over 90% of FGM, but nobody talks about it. Uganda, the same. It's an African problem. It's a third world problem. But why would we say that when we can put it into Islam? Uh, and, sorry. <laughs> okay, lastly, lastly, Brief, uh, brevity. lastly, yeah, brevity. lastly, lastly, I would like to uh, sum up with a, a saying that the Prophet of Islam said 1,600 years ago, 1,600, when even slavery didn't start it, he said, a white person is not better than a black person, and a black person is not better than a white person, an Arab is not better than an Arab, and an Arab is not better than an Arab. And that's what guides my life at the moment, and that's how I treat everyone. Thanks. We've got Tina and then Jorge it is, over it here. Is, uh, it is, if I just throw in, it is absolutely accurate that the Koran is the only one of the, of the Abrahamic texts 
that actually, in which, in which uh, it, it is said that the purpose of us being on Earth is to work out how to live together. Mm -hmm. it, it's not there in, in the others. So, so. yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Tina, and what I think we're speaking about here is very important. But there's one ism that's missing, and it's ableism. We haven't spoken about people with disability or diversability here. Um, we have these big, beautiful screens, and there was not voice to text for those uh, people that uh, cannot hear, or for the elder that was here that was hard of hearing, or also people with English as a second language. These seats are small. We're no one big welcome to, to this event. Um, bad backs. Or also, I know some people where these bright lights or this dark room would be really overwhelming for them, or this big group. And perhaps the suggestion that people can stand up and walk away and stretch their legs and all of that, there's small things that we can end up doing to make this a more welcoming place. And Thank institutions a more welcoming Thank place. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I um, I appreciate everybody's comments. I would just address one from what I said, and and I really love the story. However, just be careful around the whole similarities thing. That's one of the most powerful ways to promote racism, because the hard piece is actually being able to embrace difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can all come out of being human. It's really hard to argue that most people here are human. We never know if they're aliens, but. There is humans, yes, we can go. But the difference, working towards difference, that's what we're really trying to address. And I wanted to um, add a piece, and I, I really have learned more, quite a bit of indigenous people. I came to Canada as a refugee a few years ago, but, and, and I came with that idea of like, oh, Canada, respect, stuff like that. Many people from refugee backgrounds come to Canada initially being very thankful. And there is very little conversation of how Canada has implied involvement of producing refugees. And, and we are often, uh, I almost feel we're forced to always be thankful to Canada, to be loyal to the Queen, to be grateful and come to work and be a good immigrant. They, that's a very, very powerful piece of racism in this country. So within that, uh, the question, and I would really appreciate if I can hear some comments from the people on the, on the color thingy, that <laughs> you... The circle. The circle, that that we talk about colonization beyond this border. Colonization didn't happen between the British, French, and the indigenous people in this land. Colonization happened around the world. So really want to address the uh, point, something that Mohammed raised, and how today many immigrants and refugees who come to this country to only be part of the settler system. And very few of us are allowed or given the chance to question that dynamic and question the opportunity to actually join and decolonization struggle of this country. For example, the, so the, question, the question of indigenous and, 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 and the Canadians, like the conversation of reconciliation, was that even a conversation or was that what we were imposed as Canadians? Because I didn't hear, I, I, I have, ha, have a hard time hearing the leaders of, of the federal government who, who started that conversation of reconciliation without even acknowledging justice. Where is accountability of how Kana was formed? Yes, we can reconcile. I, I mean, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a process of healing, but definitely at what point then we talk about the whole issue of the colonization for Canada and the world. So, why don't, why don't we do this? I mean, people might want to comment on a number of things that have just been said. We have about 30 minutes left. I think I turn to you in a, in a sense, we said we would start turning this towards what can be done, which is not avoiding your point, because actually what could be done is, is very relevant. And, and from your point of view, and maybe David's, I mean, it would be a good place to start, the two of you. I mean, what, what do you think are the mechanisms? I mean, everybody's made it clear they feel that there are levels of, of institutional racism, there is personal racism, uh, we're part way down the road in terms of fixing some of the anti-indigenous uh, structures, mm -hmm. only part way down that road. What do you, what do you, what do you, I mean, what I would be really interested in hearing is what are the strategic tools that can turn things really fast? Because a number of you said, you know, the new generations are expecting a big change, not just more of the same, not something slow, something quite fast and dramatic. And what, what do you think are the tools? 
I can speak to that. I, I think the biggest tool we have is education, education in the K-12 to system for sure. And I want to uh, mention a couple of things. Adrian Clarkson mentioned this this morning. There is an education piece in Saskatchewan called We're All Treaty People. And that's all about the treaty relationship. That was created in the year 2000. In the year 2004, the UN Special Rapporteur on Racism came to Canada and he said that's a model for all of Canada and he's absolutely right. Unfortunately, it's been copied very well in Manitoba, but not very much anywhere else. That can change. Nova Scotia is working on that. The Aga Khan came to Canada in 2010 and I heard him again in 2016 and what did he say? Canada is the most successful experiment in pluralism the world has ever seen. He's absolutely right. But there's a fragility attached to that observation. And that fragility is directly related to the knowledge, understanding, and commitment all Canadians have to our multicultural, multi-theist, multi-ethnic country. Environics did a poll in June of, this, of 2016. 38% of adult Canadians over the age of 40 support multiculturalism. The rest don't. It's similar to your statistic. <clears throat> it's a huge problem. We need to make an upstream investment in education. Education is the elixir that can stop and, can, and start to heal. And so that's where we need to make that. And that, and I would say this, we need to do that in an effective way. If we fail to do that, we're going to go down the same road as Britain, uh, Netherlands, Germany, etc. And, you know, we're not going to be immune from that. So we need to invest in, in education. What would we do if we did invest in education? I submit that we'd have a pedagogy that would talk about the rights of Canadian citizenship, the responsibilities that go with those rights, and how do you build and maintain respect for every citizen, no exceptions. Why? Because every human being deserves equal moral consideration. That's an, a, a compelling pedagogy. When I talk about responsibility, some of the things I think about are, number one, as a Canadian citizen, you must know and understand your own rights so you don't knowingly transgress the rights of others. Secondly, because of who we are in Canada, very strong institutions, freedoms, education institutions, governing institutions, we need to make the world a better place. I need to see that Canadians have a responsibility to see the world through that lens. Some other responsibilities to reconcile with the First Nations, to ensure that the treaty relationship is implemented according to the spirit and intent of treaty, and that the First Nations, the Indigenous people in this country, take their rightful place in the Canadian state. It's all available to do. But we have to do it intentionally. We have to do it specifically. We have to do it explicitly. We have to do it proactively, and we have to do it with great purpose. That's the requirement. How do you do that? You get into the schools and you arm the teachers with the information they need to create an equitable society, a society of respect based on understanding, empathy, on knowledge from education. So education is the most powerful tool we have. What will happen? I submit to you, based on the treaty experience in Saskatchewan, and John Ralston Saul and Adrian Clarkson came to Saskatchewan in 2003, and I use that as a great example because in that year, I brought together 60 students, 30 from the Beery Zokamasa's First Nation, just north of Saskatoon, and 30 from a middle-class school in, in Saskatoon. <clears throat> so they were made up of non-Aboriginal uh, people, newcomers, new immigrants, and uh, in, you know, um, others. I asked those students, who here is a treaty person? 60 hands went up in the air. Why? Because those teachers had fully inculcated those students with the treaties and the treaty relationship and the treaty responsibility. Mutual respect, mutual benefit, and mutual responsibility. Those students were in grade three. So 13 years later, they, you know, they've, they graduated from university, probably, and a good number of them become part of their worldview. Yeah. And, and they're teaching their children in a different way than I was taught or many others were taught. So that's, uh, that's a real uh, demonstration of what you can do with education. We need to do that. We need to do it constructively and strategically. And I have an answer. We've done that in Saskatchewan. We do have a pedagogy called rights, responsibilities, and respect, the new three R's. What are the responsibilities, as I say, fundamental? Respect everyone. It comes down to respect, inclusion, and belonging. It's fully inculcated. And I commend this to you. It's available in French and English. Because it's the is it first... On, and is it online? It, it is. So right. you can go on to our... Uh, well, I'll go on to our website. I'll send it to John. It's Consentus Citizenship Education. I want to see that exported to every jurisdiction in Canada. 
And we need, as I say, we need to do that. If we don't make that investment now, we won't be having this conversation in 15 or 20 years. We need to do it now because we'll hit a tipping point. And that tipping point will be a student who is, embodies these things. And I call them the five E's. So the three R's, rights, responsibility, respect, the five E's. A student who is an enlightened student, this is the end product, an enlightened student, an ethical student, an uh, empathetic student, an engaged student, and an empowered student. And we'll have a different dynamic between the community and our elected representatives, a, a different accountability. I'm getting the signal now to be quiet. I just want to say <laughs> this. <be> <laughs> I commend this pedagogy. We need to invest in education. It's the only thing we can constructively do and control. And just one quick thing, John. Courageous conversations, we need to arm the teachers to have courageous conversations on six topic items, and there can be more. But I start with the Holocaust, the world's response to the Holocaust, because it created the rights revolution post the Second World War. There's a new revolution coming, and this pedagogy challenges every student from K to 12 to be part of a new revolution, a responsibility revolution. And that's what we need to see in the first half of the 21st century. Great. So they will... We have an intervention about education, in fact. Good. So I want to jump to Sue. Good, 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 good. Thank you. And David, I, I just resonate with everything that you've shared. I'm a teacher in an elementary school here in Kitsilano. I wanted to share with everyone that, particularly this year, um, but, but education is changing as Canadian society changes. But particularly this year, after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we received a, a new mandate within our curriculum to, within Canadian history, particularly at grade five, grade four is more cultural, grade five, the focus was on social justice. It was on looking at the assimilation um, agenda by the Canadian government, the residential schools, the treaties or the not treaties, sharing with the children at 10 and 11 years old. Um, I went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I was so moved, I was crying as I walked out, and a, a First Nations man held me as I sobbed and sobbed. And so there is something about being with the children that each time I share about the residential schools, I cry. And they go into a deep place of stillness. And then we talk about um, black history in BC. We talk about transgender. We, the, the children yeah. today are so open and longing and receptive. Their hearts just open and they rejoice when all of these issues are brought to them. They're holding them with such love and respect and honoring. So. Yeah, thank you, David. I just want to say, too, BC has had the social responsibility, those three R's. I think we were the first jurisdiction in Canada and maybe in the world. So there's a lot of great things happening in, in public education. Come on into the classrooms. I really invite you. Yeah. Can I make a comment? I really respect the professionalism of educators in this country, and I put a lot of stock in what they can do and what they do. And this, this teacher exemplifies exactly that. I failed to mention one quick thing as well. When we talk about the courageous conversations that we need to arm the teachers with, they include disability, mental health and addictions, uh, gender discrimination, race discrimination, Aboriginal culture and spirituality, and the respect we should all have for our Indigenous people. Now I say that just to say this, that we can do that in Canada. I have got a lot of hope, and my hope is really placed in the hearts and minds of teachers and the students they work with on a daily basis. They can shape the future citizenry of this country and we will have respect and harmony. I know it. Indeed. Thank you so much. And I have to say, you know, for a teacher to come to this and to show the passion that you do, just thank you so much. I think it, it's a huge responsibility and certainly I'm all about upstream. That's, that's where it is because then you, ha you take uh, a, a young child and you don't have to change an adult because you bring up a child in the world that we want to see in the next 150 years in Canada. Um, but it's interesting because then you're expecting this entire profession to take on this responsibility of teaching and many of them say straight out that they have no idea what they're supposed to teach. My daughter is in grade five and they just went through some curriculum on this and her biggest question is why don't people cry? 
Why are people not crying in the classroom? Why are they, are they reading the same book? Are they talking about the same thing? Should we ask grandma to come into the classroom? Because I don't think they understand. And so it's, it's interesting because how do, you, how do you integrate it? But then the, I've been at other meetings at universities with vice presidents and provosts. And you sit there and you talk about how we have to change the curriculum at university. And they say, well, everyone's learning it in elementary school and high school now. And so are we going to put on pause for our country while we wait for a next generation or two to come forward? And so you're trying to change the curriculum at a university level. And there's another challenge. And then getting the faculty to be on board. What we're trying to do, again, my lens is in healthcare. So we're trying to sort of force in that curriculum and we have the TRC as a literal, like a baton in our back pocket that can be used as a, a plate to offer appetizers on, but we can roll it up and use it as a baton if we want to. <laughs> and it has helped to bring in curriculum. But interestingly enough, another thing that we're working on now is going to the health regulators. We have to then go, they have to go to the government and you say, can you make the government say to the health regulators that you cannot give actual licenses to practice in the province of British Columbia, unless you take cultural competency, cultural safety and humility courses. If the government says that, then the College of Physicians and Surgeons, the College of Nursing, the College of Midwifery, the College of Dentistry, the College of Pharmacy, the College of Orthodontics, like everything, then, then they have to say, you know what, you need this, this and this, including you have to have proof that you've done this cultural safety training. And then all of a sudden, the universities say, well, you know, we better do this because then otherwise our graduates can't work. And then it helps to have the high school coming through because then all of a sudden it's curriculum. And all of a sudden you're not talking about there's three distinct constitutionally recognized indigenous groups in Canada. These, these, this, our country is talking about something much bigger than that. We're talking about what does it mean? And then we're bringing in cultural safety and humility. And then we're saying, you know what? It's not just about indigenous people because you know what? There's more than those three cultures. There's 500 plus First Nations and then there's the Métis and then there's the Inuit. But you know what? What about Syri the Syrian refugees? What about the immigrants? What about the long-term generations? What about the intercultural marriages that then produce children from four, five, six, eight different countries? All of a sudden, that capacity grows. But I think we have to, that education comes from educating our politicians to say it's your responsibility to make this necessary and non-negotiable. And then everything sort of peters up from kindergarten from the governments down. And I think if we make it a multi-pronged approach of education, it is our greatest tool. And it is a carrot, not a stick. But, but, but what you're saying really though is this very basic thing. If we're a democracy, what is your list? Mm -hmm. What is number one, two, three, four, five? And, you know, going into the last election, I wrote a book to say the number one issue you should be voting in for and against people on the basis of what they will do on indigenous issues. That's the number one issue in the country. And it's that list that, you know, people, you have to, you know, women's rights, you look at history, right? Yeah, and, you know, yeah. Public education, public universities. You know, that list has to be clear that it's not taxes. It's not, you know, whatever that God knows we have on our list. It's really these, these strategic issues that need to be, to, to be changed. I mean, Max, you, I mean, you, you have your organization, the, yeah. the, the Cultural Roots Exchange. And yeah. yeah, I would say, you know, something... Canadian Roots Exchange, yeah, sorry. Something that uh, uh, I'd, I'd give us a little more, uh, a little more credit uh, and say that we can focus on more uh, than, than one issue. In fact, we must... Um, the, the only way that reconciliation is going to work is if we talk about reconciliation uh, in rural communities, which we aren't enough. They're too often centered in cities. If we talk about reconciliation, we, have, we must talk about reconciliation between newcomers uh, and indigenous people, between Muslims and indigenous people, um, you know, between uh, uh, young people uh, who, are, who are indigenous and non-Indigenous. I hosted with Canadian Roots Exchange, which you can make a donation at canadianrootsexchange.ca. Uh, <laughs> we held an event uh, that brought together uh, Muslim and Indigenous young people. And we talked about solidarity. We talked about this, this great path that we're on. We, we talked about our shared experiences. Um, uh, a clear theme that emerged from those conversations, from those uh, young leaders, uh, was that we, we sit at uh, a fork in the road. Uh, 
as, as a country. We sit, on the one hand, is uh, the rage and that we know so well. It's that familiar path of protest and poverty. It's that path of pain that we've been on for the last 150 years as a country. Uh, we, on the other side, we're offered reconciliation, which I will say uh, came from residential school survivors. The idea of reconciliation, it was a gift uh, that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where folks like my father, who attended residential school and had, uh, had um, incredible abuses, uh, you know, and, and uh, communities who, who had genocides inflicted upon them. And I, I use that word purposefully, and I'm not afraid to. Um, they have said, what happened must never happen again. They've said, um, we're here. Uh, we sit with you. Reconciliation uh, is about learning uh, to thrive with one another. Not just live with one another, but thrive with one another. Uh, to bring it back to this event, um, there were tears, certainly, as we, we reflected on, on, uh, on the pain that each of us uh, experienced. But more than anything, there was that sense of hope, that idea um, that when we come together, when we work together, uh, when, when we begin to understand each other um, in every, every way, in the, the spiritual, the physical, um, you know, the, the intellectual, um, all of these things, uh, that's meaningful reconciliation, and that's when we get to go down the path of reconciliation. Many more events like that must occur before this happens, but I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of um, uh, a study, I think uh, you know, it was the same study last summer that came out, 80% uh, of young people, 18 to 29, 80%, 80, believe that meaningful reconciliation uh, is achievable in their lifetime. Now, what a gift is that for this country. So, well, first, let, if you don't mind, we'll go to a couple of people in the audience. We've got three over here. We've got Trevor, yeah, Sylvia, and, and Kari, and we're going to go lightning round. Lightning fast and and a, very quick, a very quick, I like the uh, witnesses to make their way backstage to start having their conversation? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Trevor Bode, I'm an architecture critic and urbanist uh, with a practical solution. Uh, we architects have a phrase called paralysis by analysis. Um, uh, we all know this because when a client comes asking for plans for a building and six weeks later, we give them a one page letter saying, yes, you need a building. With a six figure invoice, we don't get paid. So here's a, a simple proposal to put paid to this afternoon. The largest potential sites of development in the city of Vancouver are controlled by First Nations. There's the Heather and 33rd site, there's the Foot Burrard, and there's Canada's most valuable single piece of real estate at Jericho. These lands are proceeding without, not under the rules of urban planning because they're exempt. So there's a great deal of deal of fear and trepidation on all sides about how do we make new homes, new city building in a new way. And no one knows how to proceed as being nominated by public relations, not dialogue. I propose to the Vancouverites in the room and indeed to Six Degrees that working on the specific problem of how to build one quarter of all the new homes in Vancouver the next 10 years will occur here. If we can find a better way to work and think together, I think we can do much better than slick last hours with sculptures in the lobby. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. We have Sylvia Brief. Um, I'm Sylvia. Am I on? Yes. I'm Sylvia, and I'm the blonde haired, blue eyed mother of Indigenous um, children that I raised in Sarlacc mm. First Nation. So I have, I have two points. One is um, being the blonde-haired side, and I really relate to you, you are so like my children right there. With the hope, the hope that this young man has, I have that hope because I have the same kids. But 
Um, my people, my people that uh, were on the side of uh, watching me raise my children, I have to say are uh, not like this group here. They're in denial of their racism. They really, truly are. You scratch the surface and you don't have to scratch the surface very far. And you have this special, special case of racism that Canadians have. And I don't think that we're going to go very far until we actually expose that in some... Mm -hmm. um, and, and they don't like it. They don't like it. But I loved what... Um, David said about education, treaty, um, uh, rights and title and all that, but I, I just got to say what my daughter, my youngest daughter says, Mom, to be um, an Indian, that's what she would say, to be an Indian is a political statement. All I got to do is say I'm an Indian and bam, I get hit with benefits, with rights, with land. She says, I'm out at a pub and that's what I get hit with. So she says, yes, we need to educate Canadians all about that, but the more Canadians are educated about rights and title and benefits and she says the more political they are and I become a more political person. She's this beautiful young woman that gets hit with that every time she goes out and the more Canadians know that that's what it means to be Aboriginal is rights and title and all these historical wrongs and res she says no, no, what we need is to know each other. They need to know our hockey players. They need to know me. I'm a nurse. They need to know my daughter. She's a dancer. They, we need to know each other as human beings because somehow Canadians don't get it. Indians, uh, taken advisedly, I'm saying that, but that's what she says, are humans. They aren't a series of things they need to be educated about, about all our rights that actually just cheese everybody else off. So that's from her. She'd be happy I said that today. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. And Kari. Brevity, darling. Brevity. Brevity. My name's Brevity. Um, I guess one of the things that I thought wasn't really talked about at all today was capitalism and its relationship to environment, housing, displacement, slavery, the sites, sea dam, sugar, cotton, Colton, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. There you go. Yeah, I just like for somebody to speak to the role that they think capitalism has in this world and how it can be shifted. John, do you want to address that or do you want to take a couple more? <laughs> <laughs> brevity, John. Brevity. Okay. brevity. I, I, I mean, I don't know what to say. I've written a couple of thousand pages on the subject. I, I, I don't think this is the time for me to do it. I mean, I, I think it's a very, very, you know, the, how, how society is functioning. You know, at the beginning, I talked about there are models, the Westphalian nation state. There are all sorts of assumptions in societies and those assumptions are not discussed. Uh, there have always been marketplaces. What we have now is a very different kind of marketplace. And we're not having very serious discussions about how the marketplaces have been changed in the last 40 years. Um, I can't do it today, but I, 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 think it, you know, I think that conversation is actually happening, strangely enough. Um, it doesn't seem like it's happening because things seem to be going backwards in various countries. But actually, there's a, a far lower level of buy-in to the assumption that it has to work that way. The real risk is um, people falling back on the old, well then, and then they have a model of socialism. So you're just back to the old Manichaean for and against. It's really the necessity of inventing uh, new balances. And I think, again, these ideas of, for example, indigenous philosophy that, that include a, a celebration of the group and a celebration of the individual at the same time, which is actually in our constitution, strangely enough, almost by accident. Uh, it's very indigenous. I mean, these are very interesting methods for doing it differently, but you have to take it into action, and that's, that's the hard part. John, very, three yeah. very quick ones from this end, and then you can... Where are you? Oh, there you go. <clears throat> and then about four or five minutes to wrap up. Yes, sir. So it follows uh, similarly to the last question, so very briefly. I was thinking of Dr. Uh, Carrell's um, comment. I was a medical doctor that graduated from U of T a few years ago with three uh, queer students in the class, one black person, and no one who was self-identified as a First Nations person. About 20% of her class had parents who were, who were physicians. Um, Say that again, sir? I, in my, in my no, medical class. No, the last sentence. Yeah. Uh, 20% of my class had parents who were physicians. Mm -hmm. And it was picking up on the, the comment of income inequality. And now we have a system that, that may not work for certain people, but works very well for certain segments of our society. And so the comment really was trying to pick up on that and saying that um, when, it, when we're thinking about economics and capitalism, that I think it was something that we, we didn't discuss a lot today, but I know that um, in healthcare we always focus on as being the biggest determinant of health and, and who's getting money and who's getting income in the society. Yeah. 
Right. Well, and, 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 and if, if I could add, the, the extent to which families in which somebody has a serious illness, everybody knows that the, the, the sick person and their family have to become the key advisor mm -hmm. because the complexity of the healthcare system and the pressures on it are such that if the family isn't able to take it on, they're going to be at a disadvantage. And so that's where your, your you know, upper middle class group gets the advantage because they have more time, more education to take on this role of guiding, of guiding the patient. Is that right? I think I'm saying that, yeah, yeah. Uh, my name's Kat, I'm a UBC student, um, and I just kind of wanted to complicate, we, we're talking a lot of today about um, the role of education, but um, I kind of wanted to reframe that idea into talking about the media, um, because when we talk about education, for one, it's very un unidirectional, it's, uh, it's pedagogy, and uh, we're thinking a lot more about children than the people, you know, adults and the conversations we're having. So if we really want to consider like the dominant discourses and think about how we can potentially disrupt these dominant discourses, we need to start thinking about media. And um, beyond, you know, the content of the media that we say, it's not just about, you know, uh, paying lip surface to um, talking about issues of diversity, but um, as you know, the famous Canadian Marshall McLuhan said, the uh, medium is the message. And so I think we also need to start thinking about how can we make spaces for people of diverse backgrounds in the media? How can we, um, you know, as a white person, as a pers person of pr privilege, um, I absolutely try to think about how can I make the space um, so that other people's voices that have more, um, you know, <laughs> a more power on the issues that affect Canada as a whole um, come to light. And so I'd love to see more, you know, federal and provincial funds going into um, programs where, um, yeah, like media programs. And it, and it was interesting that the CBC, and I've forgotten if it was six years ago or seven years ago, was nowhere on the Indigenous issue, absolutely nowhere. Yeah. And they had a series of meetings. I came to one of them with a bunch of my Indigenous friends, and I arrived late, and they were all were sitting there going, <laughs> you know, and they'd been trying to explain, and the people at the CBC were saying, well, we don't know what to do. But then, actually, they figured it out, and today the CBC is really doing a pretty good job. They just, And I remember one of the things I said at the time was, you know, you just desperately try to think of how to shock them into it. And I said, you know, the next time there's a financial collapse, why don't you call up the national chief? Hmm. You don't have to just ask him about indigenous issues. You can ask him about anything. Right? I think it was when Sean was there, actually, when I was saying it. And, but I mean, they really, CBC has moved massively on that issue. And I think the private sector may be more difficult. John, we have one yeah. a final yeah. intervention, and then you have five minutes to wrap up with your guests. Yeah, Hello, my name is Debbie Bell, and I'm the um, national director of a program that is called the Home Instruction for Parents of Preschool Youngsters <laughs> Long, but we work with low-income, low-literacy parents, and we send home visitors into the home to work with the parents to develop their, largely the mothers, to develop their capacity to prepare their kids for school. It's an international program. We came to Canada, and, and I guess the point that I want to make that I, we've talked about education in the school, but I think education in the home is equally as important, and our citizens are raised in the home, and what happens there spills into society. We had this project where we wanted to Canadianize the curriculum, and we decided in Canada to add a book called Black Book of Colors, which was a visually impaired, and uh, Eddie Longpants was a kid who was too tall and he was bullied, and we added six Aboriginal books, and we added Chin Chang and the Dr Dragon Dance, and the, our sites around the country said, no, we want Dora, we want <laughs> all these things, but we wanted Dora. parents, Dora and we, we, we had to, like, for two years, got such negative feedback from the communities, but all of a sudden we started hearing parents were talking about visual impairment and they were talking about bullying and they were talking about Aboriginal issues even though 90% of the people who participate in the program are newcomers and refugees that they started understanding. So I think we have to shift that conversation into the homes because by the time kids get to school, it could be too late. Thank you very much. John, what do you think? 
five minutes to well, well, wrap let's, up? Well, yeah. well, let's do, the, to, if we can, do two things. I mean, maybe you could just add something in because you didn't get your chance. And then I think we should try and force ourselves to go around really fast and say something we didn't say about, about what the, the uh, you know, I know you've already said it's education, but just something that's the strategic mechanisms. Maybe, yeah. you know, if I may build on that, I do agree with you. And in my opinion, I also agree with you uh, that education is the most important answer to this question. Uh, but it's also, we can break it down to different levels. So it's also the personal choices that we make. It's where we bank or we, where we invest our money. It's where, or it's, it's all about how can we introduce inclusive initiatives. I can, um, we have amazing Vancouverites here in the room that have taken a, a, a leadership role in terms of providing inclusive solutions to this question. Uh, I invite all of you to visit the uh, Welcome Center where I work um, at the Immigrant Services Society of BC, where we introduced the first model of itself where we have all services that any newcomer or refugee would need under one roof. And we are introducing... Where is it? Where is it actually? It's uh, here at the heart of Vancouver in East Van, um, Victoria Drive. Um, I would love to have you there if you can. Uh, we are introducing the the first of its kind facility uh, in the world that can be the newcomer's mall, so to speak. Uh, other initiatives here in Vancouver, like um, Renee Black is here, and she's trying to build the dream app for immigrants and refugees where they can network and seek services and find everything in one place. It's those inclusive initiatives and, uh, and uh, uh, personal choices that we respond to this question, we cope with our diversity and multiculturalism with innovative ways, with creativity in doing very good on many levels and unfolding many layers that are acting as barriers to getting right. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'd like to pick up on some things that you said that I think are really important, that some things that you all said, I think these conversations are absolutely critical because maybe there are folks sitting here who see the world slightly differently today. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of us who have had our thoughts reinforced and broadened. And I think what we have to realize is we have enormous power as citizens and communities to push. And we have to hold not just our politicians, but all of our institutions accountable. So we have to hold our public institutions accountable from schools, definitely, but also criminal justice systems, the police, um, and, and, and our not-for-profits, but also our private um, corporations accountable for how they deal with these issues. So we, I think that if you look at, for instance, the private sector, which again, as June was saying earlier, it's not just boards of directors, it's actually senior management. It's who gets listened to, it's who has the power and who gets decisions made. If we start, and I think that if they were truly equitable and those voices, those diverse voices that weren't afraid that pushing against the status quo was going to be a career limiting move, I think if those voices yeah. were encouraged, we would have really thoughtful perspectives in there and then capitalism would start to shift. And then I think we would start to have something that actually began to deal with resources differently, that began to deal with people differently. I think we would have real change. We can actually hold our institutions accountable and I think that's really something we need to push to do. Yeah, and there are, I mean, what's interesting, and, and it's, you know, going back to, it's, it's, it's June, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't She's know, not here, but she was. I keep... well, what she said, I mean, I think, yeah. it, 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 you know, we see with the Six Degrees and the ICC that there are private corporations that have actually, you know, forced themselves to put in place diversity councils, which actually meet regularly under the CEO and uh, try and figure out what do you do? How do you do it? What, you know, the, the, I mean, the, uh, one which, for example, uh, uh, when it's looking for young people, really smart ideas, the entire competition is blind. There's, there's, you don't see, you don't know the name, you don't know anything, and the result is about 70% of the people who win are new Canadians. Mm -hmm. You know, 
It's, it, you know, because they've removed that barrier, which is the name visible barrier, which people may not even consciously realize their racism or their exclusion or just looking after their own sort of thing. Um, but, you, you, you know, so there's a, uh, uh, there are all these technical ways that some people are picking up. Do we have to pass a law that says that every major corporation has to have a diversity council? You can't force small corporations maybe to do it because they can't afford it, but medium big ones to do it. I mean... I would also argue they need to go a lot farther than diversity councils. Of course. No, I'm just thinking of one, one tiny yeah. example yeah. of... Um, yeah. Now, uh, any other thoughts that people want to throw out? John, do you think we could do a lightning round with our guests and just uh, sort of a, a single comment, uh, maybe something you haven't said, something mm. you'd like to reflect, and then we want to send these fine folks off for a very yeah. quick refreshment so we can come back for our witnessing. Should we, should we go around this way? Start with you. Sure, sure. Uh, I was sort of looking at it and hearing today, there's two, there's some examples that are for solutions that are long term and ones that are just like right now, this is what we need to do and we need to implement it across country now sort of thing. And so I was thinking of, I love quotes. And so I have two quotes I'm going to share with you and then pass it along. Um, I think for short term is uh, that this is a, a major issue and just by the passion that you're hearing in the voices of, from the audience and, and the fact that it's, uh, that everyone's here today um, is uh, you can, it's massive and you cannot cross a chasm in two small jumps. And so you, at some point as a country, we need to just take a running leap and realize that what's on the other side is better. And we're, we're great now, I think, as a country, but we can be better, and we need to take that running leap and address these issues. Um, but there's long-term. There's long-term, and, uh, and we're not all going to be able to take that jump. And the quote that I love there is a Greek proverb, and it's, a society grows great when old men or old women uh, plant trees in whose shade they know they'll never sit. And I think at some point we have to realize that as much hurt as there's been and as much uh, the challenges that we're putting out there, whether it doesn't matter who we're talking about, whether it's youth or the old, uh, older generations, whether it's uh, immigrants and refugees, whether it's indigenous or Canadians overall, um, we need to pick a seed that we're passionate about, pick it and plant it and be part of watering it and taking care of it and nurturing it and know that it will be your children or your children's children or seven generations from now that will benefit from it. But trust that we're a good enough country that we will benefit from it. Miigwech. I'm going to cheekily once again encourage brevity. <laughs> I thought it was pretty brief. <laughs> David. Right. Um, we, I think there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope in this room. We, we do have to recognize, in fact, that we are the world's success in pluralism. We've got a lot vested in it. A wise philosopher once said, the extent to which we've been successful in multiculturalism in Canada is directly related to the investment we, we made. I don't want to mention his name, but his initials are John Ralston Saul. <laughs> <laughs> And so we need to continue to make that investment. Thank you. We must celebrate our successes. Um, I'm not out here working my ass off, uh, <laughs> just so we continue to talk about the same problems uh, that, that exist in our country. We have uh, indigenous young people who are banging at the door, waiting to be invited in and take their rightful seat at the table, uh, who we can uh, look to for solutions, for answers. Samara Canada, uh, this year named three Indigenous women uh, as their political citizens of the, year, of the year. That's the trend for Canada. That's what Canadians have to get used to. Uh, and I'd encourage you all uh, to join us in, in seeing that promise, seeing that potential, and, uh, and uh, working with Indigenous youth. So I come from a mixed background from South Africa. My parents escaped uh, apartheid. And I think that one of the things that, that, um, that, that really pained them was that what they came to um, in many ways wasn't very different from what they left. 
Uh, and, and I think that there is an enormous gap between the rhetoric and the reality. Mm -hmm. But I also think that that's where our hope lies. Because it means so much to us to be the country that we've been talking about. We can see the Canada we want in our, in our, right in front of us. And that's the thing that will help us to get there in, for all the reasons that you have been saying. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm very hopeful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, um, I want to end uh, on one note, which is um, uh, I'm really happy we're having this discussion. It's much needed. I want us to continue having these discussions, having in mind that change is not something that happens overnight. Change is a process. Uh, we will not wake up tomorrow and see our first indigenous prime minister or our first um, Obama of Canada or anything. But we have to know that we can get there. It's all about having a right compass that guides our future, encompasses our discussions, and we have to know where to stand. Uh, I was asked, like um, the rest of um, the audience here, to bring something that reminds me of home. Uh, that's why I decided to wear my favorite shirt. <laughs> it's very old, and um, I must stop wearing it soon. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's something that I brought from home. This shirt was made in Aleppo, sold in Damascus, mm -hmm. and it was the last item I bought from Syria, and it was the shirt that I had on when I first entered Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very heartbreaking that you know all I have from Syria is a, an old shirt that I have to stop wearing. But um, uh, a friend once told me that uh, birds do not live in the tree. Birds live in the nest they built in the tree. So we have to be very serious about nesting and making our home here in Canada in, in this beautiful tree that is called Canada. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just, um, just add at the end uh, as, as kind of prerogative. I mean, it's interesting we didn't mention it. I think it was, it, it was very good the way the conversation went. But, but, you know, if I look at from the point of view of uh, uh, immigrants to Canada, refugees, one of their biggest disappointments is that many arrive with credentials which are not accepted. Mm -hmm. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have professional associations, doctors, lawyers, uh, engineers, etc., and they use those professional associations to make sure that there are no programs in place to help those people get from not be having their credentials accepted to having them accepted. That's a, that is something that's doable real fast, real fast. And you know, we have a big shortage of GPs. We could solve that problem. The Germans are leaping ahead of us. They're putting programs in place that say, if you come from Hyderabad University with a medical degree, here is precisely what you need to do to be a practicing uh, uh, GP in Germany, and here's the program that we're putting in place to get you through it as fast as possible. That's laziness, maybe it's racism, it's certainly protectionism mm -hmm. on our part. This is the kind of thing, these, this could be done real fast, mm -hmm. and it will require the governments to step, kick mm -hmm. the professional associations out of the room, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the, the other comment I would make is that, I'd make two, it's the leap, the leap, the leap of the, 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 the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is built on the foundation of the Erasmus condition, uh, Commission and the, the Mackenzie River Commission. So this is thousands and thousands of pages that produce these recommendations. The government said they will put them in place. Just put them in place. Make, make the leap. leap. <laughs> make the leap and see where we are after it's put in place. Last comment. I actually, and, and, and you all heard me say this in various ways, I actually think we have a real advantage. Some of it we've already taken advantage of but not admitted, some we haven't, which is that I the indigenous people have a philosophy. Richard Atlio, I thought was beautiful and is a great, great philosopher, one of the greatest in the country, uh, have a philosophy which is not the European philosophy, which actually is very appropriate to what we're trying to do here. So everybody who isn't indigenous has an enormous interest 
in seeing that these indigenous ideas of how people work together and have multiple personalities and have overlapping loyalties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that these are pushed forward because these are roads for all of us to accomplish the sort of things which I think everybody in the audience has been talking about. This is not romanticism. This is reality. You, we're, we've been dealt a very fine card in spite of the horrible things done over the last 150 years. And that card is indigenous philosophy and ways of doing things. And we have to learn how to be, through humility, to take, to ask. We've already been offered it. People like Richard Attlee will come and they write books and they say, here it is. So it's not about stealing it. They're offering it. And we have to have the courage and the intelligence to say, enough with uh, Burke. I mean, sure, you can read Burke if you want. You can read Rousseau. You can read Kant. But this stuff is really, really interesting for the kind of society we're trying to build, I think. So, Rich, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much to Nadine, David, Max, Rima, Muhammad, and, of course, John.